Uh, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Akif, um, and today I'm going to be talking about string hashing. It's our first advanced lecture, so welcome everyone. Um, okay. So um, the the goal of string hashing uh, is that we have some string s um, and consider some substring of s. So so this substring s uh, l l r is just the letters from l to r minus one. It's exclu exclusive on the on the right endpoint, but yeah, it's just a substring. It's all the characters, um, and we want to be able to tell when two sub substrings are equal. So we're going to check when S A B is equal to S C D. Um, and the question is, can we do this really fast? Like, can we do this in constant time? Um, so the naive approach of just checking all the characters one by one would take O N time at worst case, right? The length of the substring. Um, so is the question is, can we do some sort of pre-computation to make this to make the queries faster? Um, so why do we care about this problem? Uh, why is it interesting to us? So first of all, it has a really simple implementation. Uh, the ideas are pretty simple, and the implementation, I think, is even simpler than that. It's really neat. Um, and you can just, and once you've implemented it, you can basically use it as a black box. You just get to call this function, and it tells you the hash of a substring, which we'll see in a second. Um, and this substring hashing sort of acts as a replacement for a whole bunch of other more sophisticated string algorithms. Um, the example here is our, the Z algorithm, the new smart Pratt, KMP, uh, creating suffix array the, the usual way, <clears throat> um, the prefix function, I think, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of string algorithms that this if effectively pretty much replaces most of the time. Um, and even more than that, it sort of uh, lets you do other fancy things that I think the other ones can't really do uh, easily. Um, OK. So what's the basic idea of string hashing? Uh, so as I sort of indicated in the previous slide, we want to compute a hash for a given substring. So if we have SAB and SCD, we can compute a hash for, for that substring. Uh, so this is a function from the, uh, the characters in that substring, from, from that substring to just like a number. Um, and yeah, and so if these substrings are equal, then the hashes will for sure be equal. Um, and we want to design this hash in such a way that the, if the substrings are not equal, then the hashes will also not be equal with very high probability. So this gives a very uh, uh, sort of almost certain way to check whether two substrings are equal. OK. So now let's define the hash of a string. So, so first of all, we replace each character in the string with its ASCII value. Uh, this, you don't need to do it exactly this way, but this just makes it easier because uh, characters in a string already represented in computer memory as their ASCII value. Okay. We just want to make it a, a list of numbers as opposed to a list of characters. Okay. Um, then let uh, m be some large prime, and p be any value in the range from 256, so above the max value that the string can have, up to m. Um, the, uh, so you want to think about p as sort of like a base here. Um, and m is just how we're doing the math. It's, it's a modulus. Um, so then, in that case, the hash of some string, s0 uh, to sn minus 1, uh, is this polynomial written down here. Um, so what we're doing, basically, is we're just uh, adding up all the characters, except each character gets multiplied by a different power of p. Um, and, and it's sort of weird here, uh, the way we have it set up. It's nicer this way. Uh, but the, the, the way it is is that uh, from the beginning of the string, it gets the biggest power. And then it goes all the way down as you go forward in the string, all the way down to p, equals p, p to the 0 equals 1. So you can see, yeah, p n was the biggest power, then one less power, one smaller power, so on, up to p zero. Okay, um, and then this whole thing is done under mod m. Uh, any questions on that so far? Okay. So one uh, quick thing, and oh, yes, yeah, before we do that, one quick thing to notice is that um, the reason we say one to two fifty five instead of zero to two fifty five here is that um, if you let a character have value 0, um, then that can kind of mess up your hashing a little bit um, and make some strings equal that shouldn't be. Um, but as long as none of your characters have value 0, you're good. Yeah. Uh, what is p equal 0, p, p to the 0? That's just 1. It's p raised to the power 0. It's just 1. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, and as I said before, the mod m is applied in any addition multiplication we do of hashes. Okay. okay, good. 
Um, so, okay, so now how do we pre-compute this to make the hashing easier? Because as it is right now, computing this polynomial isn't any faster than just comparing the actual characters, right? It's, it takes O n to, to just compute these multiplications and additions. But let's see if we can pre-compute to do this faster. So what we pre-compute is we pre-compute all the hashes of all prefixes of s and also all the, uh, all the powers of p, so the first n powers of p. Um, okay? So this side is pretty self-explanatory on the right. Um, it's just raising powers of p. Um, and on the left here, uh, we have the hashes. So the hashes of the empty string is 0. right? The hash of a one character string, the, the first prefix is s0 times p0, p to 0, but that's just 1. Um, then, then this side is, then for two characters, is S0, S1, so it's S0 times P plus S1, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, and the trick here is that this can be p com computed in linear time, because each sort of value in the array can be easily computed from the previous value in the array. So uh, this side is, again, pretty obvious, because you have, if you have P to the K here, it's like P to the 2, it's just P, uh, P to the 1 times P. So it's just, you just keep on multiplying by P. Uh, this side is slightly less obvious, but it's not that bad. Uh, what you do is you take the, if you look here, for example, you just take the previous value and multiply it by p to move all the uh, powers up. So this is uh, p to the 1, p to the 0. If you multiply this by p, you get p squared and, and p here. And then you just uh, add your final character with p to the 0, which is just 1. So you take the previous value of the hash, previous prefix, multiply it by p, and add your new character. And you just keep doing that. It's a simple for loop. So now, how do these pre-computer pre prefixes let us compute these, the uh, hash of any substring, not just a prefix? Okay. So let's examine what the hash of a substring looks like. Right? So let's look in the uh, substring. Can you, can you slow down a bit and just go last side? I think people, Yeah. there's a couple questions. Oh, sorry, I didn't see uh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one thing is, so p is uh, basically just an arbitrary constant here. Um, yeah, it does not have to be prime. Uh, yeah. yeah I, we were sometimes using A for it, but I don't know why we started using P. It's just how we write it. Um, yeah, just a base. Um, but yeah, it does need to be co prime to M, so that's why it's nice to pick a prime M. If it's not, then you have to do some other stuff. Um, you can kind of consider this a DP, but it's really just a for loop where you just use the, the, the directly previous value. Okay. Does that make sense? Keep going. Yeah, please. Yeah, tell. Uh, I didn't. I don't hear the, the beeps for the questions. I don't think. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. let you know. Okay. Okay. So yeah, how do we compute the hash of an arbitrary substring uh, LR? So I'm going to call this value HLR. Okay. So let's write it out just explicitly the polynomial for it. Um, it's going to be as so. The, what's the length of this? The length of this is uh, r minus l. So the highest power we see uh, for the first character is r minus l minus one, based on our definition of, of the hash. Uh, oh, by the way, I haven't mentioned this, but if you want to look this up, it's called a polynomial rolling hash, just so you know. It's like a polynomial, and the hash sort of depends on the hash of, a, of the previous ones, like rolling in that sense. Okay, anyways, yeah, so we have this highest power, r minus l minus 1. And as we go forward from sl to sr minus 1, to the final character, we just reduce the, uh, the power of p. Okay, so this is what hlr is explicitly. Okay, um, so now we can use some, a, tr a trick here. We can just add 0. So we're going to add and subtract this same value. This, the, this val oh, do I have a pointer here? How do I get a laser pointer? Uh, L. Press L. Press L? No? Yeah, oh, yeah, no. There you go. Okay, yeah, yeah. Nice. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have, uh, uh, yeah, so we're going to add, uh, add 0. So we're going to add this value and subtract it out from this side. OK. And this is just the sort of hash of the first uh, of the, the part of the string before our substring starts. You can see this S0 to SL minus 1, right? Uh, it, yeah, and yeah, that's basically what it is. And you can see that it has uh, uh, power, uh, starts out with power a, a P to the R minus 1. So you're sort of considering the string up to R, the entire string up to R, and then you're sort of looking at the hash here of the, of the, of the string up to R, the start of our substring. And you're adding and subtracting this. Okay. Um, so then, kind of obviously, this part sort of merges, 
right? You can you can sort of merge these. This just becomes the hash from uh, the start up from the start up to the end of our the so start of the string to the end of our substring, uh, right? Because uh, you, you go from S0 up to SR minus 1. So that's just the substring up to SR. And you have the power SR, um, you have the power P to the R minus 1. So this is just a definition of the hash up to uh, R, R. OK? Um, and here, we can factor out uh, a power P to the R minus 1. Because you can see here that all the, that the smallest power we have is R, R, R minus L. So you can factor, that R, R, factor out R minus L. And we end up with just P to the 0. Um, and now, these are all values that we know. So this part, is, as I mentioned before, is just a hash up to R. It's a hash of the prefix of the string up to R. Uh, this part is just a hash of the prefix up to L. And we have this power of uh, P to the R, mi R minus L, um, which we, can, we have pre-computed also. And so we can compute our hash just at this very simple formula. Does anyone have questions on this? Because there's a lot happening here. Yeah. Uh, this is a one time now. So th these these are the these are this is like the, the proof here. The first three lines is me manipulating algebra, but then once we get down here, it's just one subtraction and one multiplication. That's all we need to do. Uh, unless you're asking the pre-computation, the pre-computation took O n time with the for loop, but when we're computing a hash, it's just just one simple um, subtraction and multiplication. I mean, uh, so yeah, uh, that's the. Uh, uh, that's what we do. We can, I mean, in, in a sense, that's what's happening is we're computing the hash from uh, R minus 1 to 0, and then we're uh, subtracting out the, 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 the L side from, from L minus 1 to 0. Um, but we're not actually physically doing that. That's what's happening under the hood. But what we're, all we're doing is we are using the values that we have already and, subtract, and just subtracting those out. So that's why it only takes a one time. But yeah, that's basically what's happening. Uh, this PR minus L thing is just needed to shift the values, basically. Um, not really. It would be log n, right? So these values are uh, in a mod, right? So we can't. First of all, even the, the basic power function in uh, in in, math, in your math library will be not o one time. It'll just be I don't know. It either be log n or o n time or whatever or some sort of Taylor series type thing they do. Um, but more importantly, this this is not p uh, p to the r minus l in in real numbers. This is p to the r minus l mod m. So the way you would do that is use binary exponentiation, which would take a log n time. That's why we have to pre-compute them. Yeah, I think by default, uh, the power function is usually O of n, right? It's like manually doing the. Uh, I think it's not, I think it doesn't sort of tail. It's not tail. Not actually tail series, but some sort of a, like thing, like some sort of convergence okay. or something. Um, GCC has like a built-in I power or whatever, which does the binary exploitation for you. But yeah, yeah. in general for CP, um, you usually want to compute powers like the way we have it here, like in an array, um, and like pre-compute it beforehand, um, because the built-in power function isn't great. Like even if you do want to get the actual power value. Yeah. Um, and just and just to remind you guys, this thing is happening mod m. So this equation has to be done with all the added mods that you need. To take care of the subtraction multiplication. Okay. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, as I said, it could be an one. Okay, so now let's talk about decreasing failure probability. So, um, as I mentioned in the very first slide, uh, two different substrings can technically hash the same value. It just has a very small probability, um, and you can prove that this probability is one over m. So if we use long longs, uh, then our mod value can be around 10 to the ninth. So this prob failure probability, probability of a collision, collision meaning two things hashing to the same value, is 10 to the negative 9, 1 over a billion. So this is good, um, but sometimes this is not good enough. Um, if you have to do a lot of queries, uh, or even a lot of test cases or whatever, um, then just by them by itself, uh, it could be, uh, you could have a good prob probability of having a collision somewhere. 
Um, and this is made even worse by the fact that if you have a birthday paradox, uh, which is like, if you have a whole bunch of substrings and you're looking for a collision between any two pair of them, uh, then the probability becomes sort of squared of getting a collision. Like becomes the number of sort of coll potential collisions becomes squared. Um, and your yeah, and so your probability doesn't really stand up in that case. So around if you have more than thirty-five thousand queries or, uh, around, sorry, three hundred fifty. No, that's thirty-five thousand queries. Uh, you will probably get around one false positive. So that's not very good. You can easily conceive of a problem where you have to do more. Okay. So what are some strategies to deal with this? So first off is you can just use two hashes. Um, you just keep track of two hashes, each with a different prime m, and you only uh, consider two substrings equal if both hashes match. Um, and uh, if your hash has a property called independence, it's independent hashes, which with different primes you can prove that they are, um, then the probability of both colliding is just probability of oh, just one, one over m1 times m2. Uh, so you just multiply the two probabilities. So that, that's very good. So if you have 10 to the 9 times 10 to the 9, that's 10 to the 18th. And that's certainly uh, good enough for most things. Uh, you can use the same or different p for each mod. It doesn't really matter. Um, and you can store your hashes and power arrays as pairs as opposed to single numbers. And so this is, this is a nice way to do it. Um, uh, you can also do more than two hashes if you really need to be careful. But be, be careful that, that it doesn't get too slow, because mods are notoriously slow. Uh, like the slowest, basically, it's mods or divisions like the slowest calculation you can do. Um, another thing you can do is just use bigger hashes. So instead of being stuck to a long, long, which is 64 bits, you can use 128 bit, bit in, instead. This has the same effect as double hashing because you can, again, go up to 10 to the 18th uh, without overflowing on your multiplication. Um, but then it has an added benefit that you only need to keep track of one number, not two numbers. Um, how do you use 128-bit ints? So GCC has underscore underscore int 128. Um, but you do need to be kind of careful, because if you don't have 64 bits, and depending on the platform, you might not, this might not be supported. So be careful with this. Um, all the platforms, like we, all the major ones, like Code Forces or CADIS or ICPC, this has been completely fine. Um, and on my computer, is fine too. But if you're not using GCC for some reason, or you're using some obscure platform, be, just be careful. This might screw you. Um, OK. Um, the third thing you need to consider is randomizing p. So instead of picking p ahead of time, just in your code hard coded, you can pick a random p at runtime, just making sure that it's at least 256 and less than your mod values your, okay. uh, like in, in your mod. Um, so this makes your solution much harder to hack on code forces. So I, I don't know if you guys have how much you guys use code forces yet, uh, but for the guy, you guys that have, uh, you guys might have seen like this thing called hacking, where people can try to break your solution by giving a test case that breaks it. And so there, even if uh, an arbitrary hash is very, very good probability of, of working, um, people can just actually go and look for a test case that breaks your thing. They can just brute force values until your hash breaks. Um, but if your P is random, they, don't, they can't do that because they don't know what, what your P is going to be at runtime. So they can't really find a, a brute force a counterexample that breaks it. So this is something that's very important for you to do in your actual solutions. OK. Uh, any any questions so far on this? Okay. Okay. So now let's get into implementation. Okay. Uh, there's a link to this at the end of the slides, but let's just go through it. Um, just so you guys know, uh, the previous time we did this lecture, uh, we have Joe's implementation. So if you guys if you guys maybe don't like mine as much and want to look at his, uh, that's up on YouTube too. Um, but yeah, just so you guys have, I co we cover both. I'm going to do mine this time around. Okay. Uh, they're pretty much the same. They're just slightly different. OK. So the first thing we need to do is define our, our sort of ha type, hash type. Uh, 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 it's, so our hash type is just a 120-bit int, and I'm just type defing it. To, so we just don't need to keep typing out int 128. We can just use the word hash. Okay. Um, and then we define our p array for powers of the um, for powers of the prime, or not the prime, powers for powers of the base, and uh, h for all our prefix hashes. And nn here is just a value big enough to cover all your strings. Okay. Um, then we define our parameters. So m is just some fixed prime, really big prime. So this is you can use this prime. It's big enough. It's and it's not too big that it'll overflow. It's nice. Um, 
And then we also need to make a random number generator from 256 to n minus 1. Uh, an important point is that we can't use a fixed seed here. So we have to use the clock cycles here. So this is this just starts a random number generator on the number of clock cycles that have passed so far since I think the start of your program. So that gives you a very unpredictable value if anyone tries to hack your thing on code forces. Um, yeah, and so this this dist function gives you um, a uniform distribution from 256 to n minus one. Okay. Um, yeah. this, sorry. So just, just going back in the last one, you don't need to worry too much about the random number generation here. It basically, it it's just you can use dist gen to make a random number in that range now. Um, and it's not going to be like a fixed value. That's really an important point there, I guess. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so now we uh, so now we use it. Uh, this is the whole pre-computation part that we need to do. So first off, we set p to the zero as one, and p to the one is our base, which is disgen, as, as Joe said. Um, and then we go through and just do what we had on the earlier slide. We loop over uh, all the characters in the string. Um, and we just do the power of the, the prime, uh, the, the, the base uh, powers of p is to, to the i is just this times this mod m, right? So p1 here is just the p1, just p, right? It's p to the 1. And we just take the previous value times p to the 1. Um, and then for this, it's the same formula that I had on the earlier slide, uh, just with the mod. So it's, it's exactly that. We the previous value times p plus the new character. And this will automatically convert the character to the ASCII value Yeah. in C++. Uh, you do need to be careful of the indexing here. Uh, the way we have it is sort of uh, HI plus 1 does not include H I plus, SI plus 1. It includes SI. Um, it just makes the math easier, the indexing easier this way. Um, it, but you don't have to worry about it. You can just use it as is. So. But it, yeah, if you try to do it from memory, just remember that it's sort of one index in a way, or it's a string is your index. Uh, what does LL mean? Oh, yeah, no. Uh, so I guess that's a good point. Um, yeah. It means long, long. It's not a built-in thing, but in all our code, we use uh, type def long, long LL. Uh, that's just a general sort of rule in CP that you almost never want to use ints. You can you basically, if you can get away in terms of speed with it, which you almost always can, it's just better to use LLs because you don't have to worry about overflow. And it's not no sort of loss. So at the top of all our code, we have type def long, long LL. OK. Um, so now how do we do the queries? So this is, again, the for exact formula I had in the previous slide, the earlier slide. So the substring hash from L to R, uh, exclusive on the endpoint, is just HR minus this thing and then times this thing, right? Um, yeah. So uh, you can make sure you have the mods here. So uh, it, one sort of important part is you need this plus M here, uh, because otherwise C++ mods are weird uh, if you're modding a negative number. So you need to make it back above 0 to before you mod it. And, and it returns a value in, in 128, it returns the hash. Okay. And so you can see here uh, how computing the hash is constant time, right? Because we're just accessing these three array values we already have, uh, doing some math on them, and returning the final value. Um, there's no like loops or anything in here. Uh, yeah. Any questions on the implementation? No. Okay. Let's keep going. Let's get into some, some problems. Uh, so the first problem is the longest common prefix problem. So we have some string s, and we need to query the length of the longest common prefix of two given suffixes. Um, so we have the suffix from i to the end and the suffix from j to the end. And we want the longest common prefix of them, which is the biggest L, such that their prefixes of size L are equal. And we want to do this fast, so ho hopefully like log n time. Okay. So you can see here, um, you have the string C A B A B A D, and the suffixes are from are one and three. So from here and from here. So A A, a B A B A D and A B A D. So the longest common prefix is A B A, because at this character they start differing, D versus B. So the answer is just three. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I thought there was another example. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so you guys take a few minutes, maybe think, try to think of some approaches for this. And 
And from here on out, we're basically going to be using the actual like substring hashing as a black box. Uh, so you don't need to worry about the implementation of that or anything. It's just you have a constant time function that will tell you if two substrings are equal. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. So we want a binary search on the length on the L value. Um, and so the reason we can do this is because if all the prefixes of size x match, then all the prefixes of size less than x must also match. And if this prefix of size x doesn't match, then you can't have a prefix of size greater than x that can match. So it's monotonic in that way. So we can binary search. Uh, one sort of caveat here is you need to make sure not to go outside the bounds of the string, because uh, otherwise your hash value will not be correct, like zeros or whatever. So you have to binary search on lengths only up to zero to the smallest uh, length of the suffix. Okay. And so here's the implementation of that. Uh, we, you can use whatever binary search you want. I, I've used the invariant binary search because that's my favorite. Uh, so uh, you can, uh, so zero always works. So you go from zero and, and this one will never work. The, the, the length of the smallest prefix is plus one. <clears throat> you can never have LB that big. So we're binary searching between that value. And so we just do the binary search. And if at your current value, the two substring hashes are equal, then that one works. And so you move L in, otherwise you move R in. And then you return L because that's the value that still works. That's the biggest one that still works. Okay. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, so our next problem is lexicographically less queries. So we need to query whether some substring um, s i i plus l i. So we, we're of le uh, length l i here, starting at i, is lexicographically less than j with length l j. And again, can we do this in log n time? Um, and just so you guys remember, uh, the definition of lexicographically less is like alphabetical order. It's uh, so how we sort words. So it's uh, it's less. Uh, it, uh, s is less than t if s is a prefix of t, or if we're the first position that they differ, uh, which let's call that i, uh, si is less than st. So here we can see abc is less than b because they differ at the first character, and a is less than b. Uh, similarly here, they, uh, uh, abc is a prefix of abcd, so it's less. And here, uh, they first differ at e versus f here, and e is less than f. Okay. Yeah, so. Again, I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to think about this, or if you have any questions. One hint is that uh, these problems are going to build on each other a lot. Um, so think about the previous problem, if there's anything you can use there. And also really look at the definition of lexicography less. It's sort of explicitly, the answer explicitly comes from there. Another hint. Yes, that, that, that's correct. Um, 
Well, if they're the same mm-hmm. length, um, you still don't know like what the first position where they differ is. Right, if you're just comparing right, that's true, that's true. Yeah, the yeah. to the two strings. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. Um, my bad. All right. But that's that is kind of on the right track. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is an example of that, right? They're the same. This one is an example of that. They're the same length, but I mean, how does the hash code help you find out which one is smaller? So I guess one thing is, how would you detect the first case? So how do you detect like uh, if one is a prefix of the other? What do you mean remainder equals zero? So like which strings would you want to check for quality? I guess is the question. Oh, um, yeah, try to avoid thinking about it in terms of like the like the actual hash computations we were doing. Um, I guess think about it in terms of like you want to check if some strings are equal. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. You you're that, as Joe said earlier. This is like a complete black box at this point for from the yeah. end of the implementation side on where it's a black box. You just have some hash function that magically returns you um, the hash value L to R. Um, so yeah, you want to think about like what substrings can you compare that would be useful? Um, let's take a way to explain this. Like sort of the one operation you're going to do is uh, checking two substrings for equality. And those might not necessarily be um, the two substrings you have here, right? Because there's a bunch of other substrings you can look at the hashes of and see if they're equal. And compute the hash of each letter and point which they differ. Well, how do we know where they differ? Right, because you can't loop through it because that's linear time. So how do we know when they differ? And yeah, the other hint once again is uh, think about the previous problem. Um, compare the beginning to the end. Of, so that first sentence is correct for the prefix. That's exactly correct. Yeah, I think that might be the solution. Yeah, I, I don't care about the sentence. I think he's basically saying binary search there. Yeah, um, and then yeah. So you, you guys are uh, basically on the right track. So uh, yeah, Daniel passes that path basically. Yeah, yeah. You guys have it combined, I think at least. Uh, so there's two cases as we said. So if one is a prefix of the other, then exactly as Thomas says, um, we just look at the smallest length. So we look from i starting at i, the, the smaller the two lengths, j the smaller the two lengths, and if they're equal, then uh, there, one is a prefix of the other, right? And in that case, we just want to say, uh, is the length of Li uh, less, less than Lj, in which case I is a prefix, or the other way, Lj is a prefix, so let's return Li less than Lj. Otherwise, we, as he said, binary search to find where they differ, but remember, in our last problem, we've already did that, and that's basically what the LCP is, right? The LCP is all the characters that don't differ at the beginning. So one right, the one right after that is the first character where they differ. So we kind of get, just get to use our LCP function already. So if k is the length of the LCP, if the first k characters are the same, then i plus k and j plus k are the first position where they differ. And then all we need to return is, is compare at that position and say, is s i plus k less than s j plus k? And the LCP, the binary search from there, takes log n time. But yeah, that's it. That makes sense? So let's look at the implementation. Uh, oh, I guess example first, sorry. Um, so we have uh, these two substrings. 
we look at their LCP, which is three, right, A, B, C. And then they differ at position three, zero, one, two, three. This is where they first differ. And so we just see which character is smaller at that point, and that's the smaller substring. D less than x. And this is the implementation for it. So it's pretty self-explanatory, as, as basically what the earlier slide said. If the two, if the minimum length hashes, if the, you look at their smaller length, the minimum length, and if the hashes from the start to that length is the same, then their one is a prefix to the other, and we just return li less than lj. Otherwise, it's not a prefix, and we just compute the LCP to get k, and we look at that first different character. And notice that uh, if one isn't a prefix of the other, we always have like one first different character. So we don't have to worry about going past the end of the string or whatever. Okay. Uh, next idea is that of a suffix array. Um, so we want to compute the suffix array of a string s in n log squared n time. Um, and the suffix array is a permutation of the numbers, the indices 0 to n minus 1, uh, such that for all i less than j. So if i is less than j, then we have the suffix starting at i, uh, it will, not i, but at ai, of our permutation, uh, is less than the, than the uh, suffix starting at aj. So basically, we're ordering the suffixes in their left graphic order. That's the idea here. So we're sorting them. We're sorting the suffixes. Except if we sort the actual suffixes, the suffixes themselves, that will be quadratic space. So we sort the indices at which they start. That makes sense. Uh, we have an example here for the string banana. Um, the suffixes of uh, s are are this. So the suffix starting at zero is the entire word banana. Then at one it's a n a a n a. Then at two it's n a n a. At three it's a n a. You, you can see it's all the suffixes. And if we just sort these strings, right, we get the suffix array. Except we don't want to store this as is because that's too big. It's quadratic space. So we sort the indices at which they start at this uh, indices at which they start in this order. So it's five three one zero oh, four two. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, any ideas or questions on this? Yeah. Yeah. Questions. This is a very useful tool for many other problems. So when we're uh, comparing these suffixes, we're doing it lexicographically. So it's like the same thing we had in the previous problem. So either one's a prefix of the other, like between five and three, like the suffix from five is a prefix of the suffix at three, or you find the first character where they differ, um, like between uh, one and zero. It goes from A to B in the first character. Again, hint, this really builds up on the previous problem. Sure, was that a question? Yeah, the if it is, yeah, the target complexity is n log squared n. There's a very like nice and simple solution here, but it's very hard to see if you haven't seen it before. Um, but I, I guess the one hint would be, don't overthink it too much. And the, the previous problem is gonna be very helpful.
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, good, good, good hint, Adam. Uh, Daniel basically has it, I think, um, but he's kind of over, you're overcomplicating it a little bit. Yeah, but that would work. Yeah, that that would work, but you can sort of go even easier, um, and uh, use the fact that you need to you don't it doesn't need to be dynamic. You just need to sort it once, right? So so I, I guess the the key idea here, right, as, as Daniel brought up, is that we have a primitive for comparing two uh, suffixes given the index at which they start. If a suffix starts at i and a suffix starts at j, we already know how to compare them. That's literally the last problem. So then we can just use a sorting algorithm. In fact, we just use the built-in sorting algorithm in C++ to do this, to, to sort, sort these things. So we make the suffix array to hold the suffix array, and we initialize it just to the indices. And now we just actually sort it using a built-in sorting function. Um, the only thing is we, can't, we have to sort it using our own custom comparator, which is the comparator from the last problem. So this will uh, sorting takes n log n comparisons. Um, and each comparison takes log n time, so the run square the run time is n log square n. Um, yeah, this is probably going to be a lot worse in Java. Okay. Um, um, and so the implementation is very easy here. Um, we, iota is a built-in tables plus, which just initializes everything to the value to the to the current index. So just initialize zero to n minus one, um, and then we just sort it uh, the array, and we use this cu custom comparator given by lambda. Which uses our earlier problems function, and it uses these it computes the lengths of the suffix. Yeah, so basically, what the iota does is it goes through like every point in the array um, and sets uh, suff i equal to i plus whatever you put as the third parameter here. So we usually put zero there. So that way, it just uh, basically makes it like the identity array. So like AI equals I. It's like range in Python. Except less flexible, I guess. But yeah. Anyone have questions on this? Okay, let's keep on going, I guess. OK, this one is one of my favorite ones. It's a really smart trick. Um, and so the problem is that you have a string, and you want to query whether some substring LR is k periodic, and you want to do some constant time. So a string is k periodic, of, uh, and you're given a k. K is, k is a given value. A string is k periodic if si equals si plus k um, for all the values of i where that makes sense in the string, so from 0 to n minus k. Okay. For example, here, uh, a, b, c, a, b, c, a, b. If you just look at the entire string and it and you look k equals three, yes, it is the entire string is three periodic because it's just a b c repeated over and over again. Uh, notice that it doesn't have to be perfect multiple of k. A b c doesn't be fit exactly. It just has to repeat up until up to, until like it gets cut off for it to be k periodic. Um, here, if you look at the substring from one to five, so b a b a, uh, and you look at k equals three, it's not three periodic because it repeats uh, after two. I guess. Um, and yeah. And b does not equal a. So b plus 1, 2, 3, b does not equal a here. So it's not the periodic. Yeah, so you can think of it as like the same k characters like repeated over and over again. You want to check if that's what the substring is. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to think about this, but this is, at least in my opinion, a very hard trick. Go ahead. So. Joe came up with it. He's really yeah. smart. We're basically looking for uh, an O of 1 solution. Um, so, I mean, really, it's just one comparison. Um, so how can you do, like, one equals comparison to check this?
Uh, okay, I mean, we're kind of running low on time, so let's give the answer here, I think. Oh. Sorry. Wait, what is, does that mean? Again, you don't really want to worry too much about like the actual hash computations, because um, all the problems you can do with string hashing, you really just need the string equality. Yeah, don't worry about manipulating the hashes at all. The only operation we do on the hashes is checking if they're equal or not. All the techniques we describe works, even if the hash is implemented using a different technique, like yeah. a different uh, way. Uh, this is just one way to do a hash that works, but. There's, I'm sure there's other ways to do hashes that, and all the other techniques in the sample problems can still be done exactly the same. So and I'll just give the answer here, I guess. Um, yeah. So the idea is you want to kind of explicitly do this check at si equals si plus k. Um, so what we do is we basically shift the string. So we have some substring here, um, SLR, um, and we want to sort of shift, shift it. When we shift it, uh, we get this thing. Right, S, uh, L plus K R, um, and, we, and we want to cut it off to make sure to only compare the values that sort of make sense. So we look from L to R minus K, to this one, and then L plus K R, and so this basically, and if you compare these two character by character, you're comparing whether S I equals S I plus K. Um, and also, if the length of the string is smaller than K, then it's just obviously K periodic as it is. But uh, that's a special case. But other than that, you see a check if S L to R minus K is equal to SL plus K to R. So you skip the first R characters, and you skip the last R characters, and then you compare if they're equal. So you, yeah, so basically it just shifts it and just checks. So you're for every position I here, you're checking if I plus K from the original string is equal. Does that make sense? Because like the idea is, like he said, you're comparing, you're, by doing this one check, you're sort of comparing everything with the thing k in front of it at the same time, pretty much. Yeah. So this is obviously a 1, because it's just one hash comparison, one hash of this, one hash, one, one hash of this, one hash of this, and just compare them. So it's all 1. OK. okay. Uh, next question. Uh, you're given a string s, um, and you want to query whether or not some substring is a palindrome. So uh, L to R is a palindrome. And so recall, a palindrome is a string which equals its reverse. If you flip it, it's the same thing. And you want to use, again, in constant time. So as an example here, you have this string. Uh, this The substring of just 0 to 1, the letter A, is obviously a palindrome. Same the letters are always palindromes. Uh, from 3 to 6, E, G, E, that is a palindrome. If you flip it, you get the same thing. From 1 to 5, though, B, D, E, G is not a palindrome. Because you flip it, you get G, E, D, B which is not the same thing. So, yeah. You guys can think about this. Any solutions? This one's a lot easier, I think. Uh, yeah. There's definitely a um, very non-trivial trick here. Yeah, I um, guess. That's true. Once again, here we're aiming to do this in uh, one comparison. And again, please don't think about the hashes as anything but a yeah. black box. Don't try to invert it or like anything like weird like that. So that's yeah, that's kind of what we want to do. Um, but the problem is, right now with the hashes we have, we can only compute um, the hashes of strings, like uh, I guess with L less than R. Yeah, with L less than R. Um, so that is what we are going to try to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how do we get like how do we deal with backward substrings with this?
And again, uh, don't think about like manipulating the hashes or anything like that. Uh, this is probably the, the problem where that would be like the most tempting to do. Um, but think about if there's another way we could. I think if you can manipulate the string itself that to make right. this work as opposed to. Another hint is um, this isn't something we've thought about in any of the previous problems, um, but think about the pre-computation step. Right? Because in the previous problems, uh, we just uh, did all the pre-computation on S and that was fine, that was all we needed. Um, but how can we sort of change what we're pre-computing? Yeah, can we screw with S itself before we yeah. do the computation? Right. Exactly. Yeah. They know about it. Yeah. And you can actually do kind of nicer than that um, by sort of mer pushing them into one string. So you can make a new string t uh, equals s plus dollar sign plus the backwards, the reverse of s. And dollar sign here is just any separator character that's not any original string. Um, but yeah, so then this lets you do substrings from s forwards, or if you look at this side, from s backwards. Um, and then all we need to do is check if there are substring. Uh, H, uh, that should be uh, that should be LR. Sorry, I don't know why it's LR myself. It should be LR. If H LR is the the backwards of it, basically two n minus R, two n minus L. That's that's the, the the same substring from this side. And you're just checking if the state the substring is equal in S and S rev. So here is an example uh, A of A B E G A G E C. So T is just that plus that reversed with a separator in the middle. So if you have L equals two to seven. LR is 2 to 7, then the backwards thing is from 9 to 14. So uh, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It should highlight it if you click. Oh my god, thank you yeah. so much. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it is this. So these are two things. And so you can see that, oh, they're equal in both, in both sides of it. So it must be a palindrome. This is a, another very common thing in, in sort of string problems in general, not just hashing, is if you're trying to do work with multiple strings or multiple like, strings viewed different ways, to just smash them together with separators in the middle. And you sort of get to operate on them homogeneously then. Any questions on this? Yeah, so this is the only uh, problem we've had so far where we're working with a string that's not S um, and doing hashing on that. OK, let's keep going. Yeah. Uh, similar problem, but uh, different, is to now count the number of palindromes in a substring. In, in, not in, a substring, in a string, count the number of substrings that are palindromes. Sorry, I said that badly. Okay, so we want to do this in n log n. This is another problem where the previous problem is very important. So you have O of one palindrome queries now. Um, and if we did like the trivial approach of testing every single substring, um, there's going to be n squared of those, right? So it'd be a total complexity of n squared, like constant time operations. Um, but we want to do n log n. Yeah. 
so as an example here, if you have AAA, all the substrings are palindromes because all the letters are equal. So it doesn't matter if you flip it or not. So there's 15 substrings, so the answer is 15. Here, all the single characters are palindromes, because um, obviously, and then plus you have ABA and ACA. And you can check that there's no other ones. There's no length four ones because only two length fours, so length five is not. And length three, the middle uh, one is BAC is not. So then that's the only thing. And none of the length twos are because there's no characters next to each other that are equal. So uh, S might be a palindrome, um, or it might not. We're basically just uh, trying to count, like, out of all the substrings of S, how many are palindromes. And that may or may not include, like, the entire string. Like, in the first one, um, the whole string is going to be one of those 15 palindromes. Then you also have, like, every other substring is just a series of A's. So those are all also going to be palindromes. Another hint for this one is, uh, so we're going for a complexity of n log n. Um, so think about where the log factors came from in the previous problems. Exactly. Well, close. Um, that, I think you might have the right idea. Um, yeah. But one thing is, like, if you're choosing the starting index, um, you can't really binary search from the beginning of the palindrome, right? Because, like, um, A, B, monotonic, basically. but A, B, A is. Yeah. But th that's very close. And I think you actually might have it at this point? Yeah, I always give it. Uh, yeah, I think that's close enough to the answer. Yeah. Um, so you, he's right, except you don't want to fix the starting character, you want to fix the middle character. Right? So you can, you can think of palindromes as just sort of being like, like folded into the, from the middle, right? the same thing from both sides of the middle. So if you start as a middle character and go out uh, L characters on each side, um, and if that is a palindrome, then anything less than L uh, will also be a palindrome, as long as the same parity. So here we're only considering odd length palindrome, for example, but with the same parity, right? So if you have a, a palindrome length five, right? If you go five and five on each side, uh, sorry, not five, two on each side, sorry, if the middle character and you go two on each side, so the entire thing's a length five, then if you go out only length one, let's say, that's also for sure going to be a palindrome, right? And conversely, if going out length um, five doesn't, length, let's say, two on each side doesn't make it a palindrome, then, uh, going out anymore cannot make it a palindrome. So it's monotonic in that way, and you can binary search. Okay, So we fix an I, and we just find the biggest L, such that going out L on each side gives you a palindrome. Okay? And this, this works for odd length palindrome, because you, you're fixing a middle character and going out, sort of adding, adding stuff to the end, same amount to the end and the beginning. And then we add L to your answer, because anything from uh, 1 to L for that works. Um, as an example here, if you look at i equals 4, which is just g, then l equals 1 works, l equals 2 works, l equals 3 works, you keep on going out more and more characters, and at 4 it fails. So then you know you had, you had three palindromes from this. And yeah, notice that in the actual implementation, we wouldn't check all four l's, because uh, we'd be doing a binary search to find the biggest one that works. Uh, but this is just to like visualize. Um, and for even palindromes, we can do almost exactly the same thing, except we don't have an actual middle character. We like iterate over the gaps between characters and then go out on each side. Yeah, because you could think about having, like, instead of one middle character, you have like two middle characters for an even length palindrome. Yeah, those, those need to be the same. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you, you can check that with SI equals SI equals one. So. And again, you add L to your answer. Okay. 
Anyone have questions on that? Okay, let's go. That's your last problem, I think. Yep. Okay. This one uh, is very hard. So I think this is a good one to just go give the through. answer. Yeah, this is okay. definitely. So we want to, yeah, we want to count the number of distinct substrings of S in, again, log n squared time. And we're giving the hint that this log n squared time comes from the suffix array. So we're going to use the suffix array somehow. Okay. So this is less about hashing and more about just using the suffix array, showing how to have an example of how this technique comes in useful. Okay. So a, 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 a only has five distinct substrings. Just the, 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 all, this, all the A's is of length one to five. So A, 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 so on and so forth. Right here, there's 15 distinct substrings because I think all the substrings are different, right? Because you have no characters that are the same. So all substrings will be different. And then in that case, it's just five, choose two, I think. Yeah, because you're, you're picking two. Well, not five, just five, like, tri like triangle of five. So see the other way around. No, I think it is five choose two. No, it's like six choose two. Because you're choosing two characters to be, oh, because you can have repeats. Yeah. Yeah, six choose two. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. Basically, every substring is distinct there. You don't have duplicates because every character is distinct. Yeah. So the solution here is we want to iterate over all the suffix in suffix or in sorted order, hint, suffix are right here. And we want to keep track of how many distinct substrings we've seen so far. So for each suffix, how many of its prefixes? So what is this? So the sort of important point here is what is a substring of a string? It's a prefix. One way to think about it is that it's a prefix of a suffix, right? It's kind of a stupid way to think about it, but that, that is what it is really, right? It's a prefix of a suffix. So uh, we can loop over all the suffixes and see how many of its prefixes are substrings that we have not seen before. So in, in a sense, they're distinct substrings, right? So the total number of substrings, so uh, from uh, starting from i, um, which is just the number of prefixes of sub i, is the length of sub i, so n minus sub i, right? Um, and we'll subtract out all the ones that we've seen before. So uh, the key point here is that the, the ones we've seen before must also be prefixes of sub i minus 1, right? Because that's how it works. Because the idea is like the only characters we've seen before are prefixes of uh, some suff j for j less than i. And if uh, they match, if basically if the first few characters match from uh, suff i and suff j, then for everything in between, those characters also have to match. Um, you should go to the next slide and show the example, because this is Yeah, OK. Yeah, right. I, I think you're right. Yeah. You're, you're right. The explanation yeah. is not very good. I had the example in my mind, too. No, I mean, there, I don't think there is a good way to explain this like with words. You need to see like the fact yeah. <laughs> True. Anyway, OK, so this so string is Mississippi. These are all its suffixes in a, in a sorted order of suffix array. Um, and so we look at these suffixes. We write them out in, in their sorted order. Um, and, and we look here is that, that uh, the LCP that this guy can have with any of the prefix guys is maximized here. It can't ha because otherwise, uh, like if for this to be lexicographically less than this, it also differ in like an, a more recent character, an earlier character, basically, right? Um, and so they can't. This and this can't have a better LCP. They, they might have the same LCP, which they don't here, uh, but it definitely can't be longer. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and so going back here, we can just use how many of our LCPs there are to get the number of substrings we've seen before and subtract that out. Yeah, so the idea like with this picture is we've already computed uh, the number of suffixes that start with uh, 10, 7, and 4. So those, those first three suffixes. So I, IPPI, and ISS IPPI. So we, we have the number that started those three indices that are distinct, right? And now we're moving on to the next step and we want to see how many we add there. Um, and so there are 10 uh, prefixes of that string. Um, One for each character. Wanna, right. And so we want to subtract out um, the number out of those 10 that we've seen before. And the idea is the ones that we've seen before also have to be prefixes of the last guy. Right? And the only way that's possible is if they start less than the LCP. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay. 
No, that's probably fair. Okay. Anyone have questions on this? Because this is uh, definitely a hard thing to learn. So does it make sense why we're like subtracting out four here? Right, because you have four substrings that we already counted. So I, IS, ISS, and ISSI, um, we've already counted. So we're basically subtracting those four out, and the other six that are left are these six, which are all new substrings that we haven't seen before. Um, and so in actual, in actual computing this, um, we don't actually need to do the math. The math simplifies a lot because we can just keep track of the values that we subtract each time, the LCP things. Um, and then the uh, other part, the, 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 the number of original prefixes of that suffix all add up to just n plus 1 choose 2, the total number of substrings. Yeah. And so we just take total number of substrings minus the sum of these LCPs. Uh, so that's pretty much it, unless you guys have any questions. Um, so we have a bunch of resources and problems in the next two slides. And yeah, this is, these slides are available. Okay. Uh, but before that, can I give the stuff? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is the, the template link to my good code with all the stuff you saw in the implementation slides. And these are a couple of blogs about uh, hashing and how to make it harder to hack. Uh, and these are the problems we solved, and these are some other nice problems that you should, guys should try. Okay. And now Joe will talk about next week's lecture, just so you guys have an idea. Uh, yeah, so next week we're going to be talking about Maxwell, uh, which is a really nice topic. Uh, basically, you have um, a bunch of these nodes connected by edges, which you can think about as pipes. Um, and each pipe can like handle a certain amount of water going through it. And you want to find, basically, the amount of water you can send from some node S to some node T. Um, and we're not gonna spend much time on like the actual algorithm to compute this. Uh, most of what the lecture is gonna be is um, using that algorithm, which we're gonna uh, like very much use as a black box, like even more than we had today. So we're gonna use that algorithm uh, to solve like a wide range of other problems, um, like problems where it's like very surprising that uh, you can convert it to this form. Um, so it's going to be a lot more, I guess, like puzzle solving in a sense, um, and just figuring out like, how can we apply this, uh, nice reduction, um, to convert it to this type of problem. Uh, so the very few prerequisites for this, uh, in terms of like prior knowledge and it should be a really good lecture. Uh, thanks, Akil, for, uh, yeah, glad you like the lecture. Um, so in terms of like the minimum uh, knowledge, I think we've constructed these lectures in a way so that there shouldn't be technically any prerequisites other than what we teach in the basic lectures, I think. Right, Joe? Yeah. Um, we ordered so, them in a way, yeah. Yeah, so data structures and algorithms uh, is definitely going to be enough. Um, there might be, um, there might be a couple, th no, because, uh, you do DP and algos, right? I think so. So yeah, I think deep, I think data structures and algos are going to cover most of our beginner stuff anyway. Um, so yeah, between either like going to the beginner lectures or like having taken algos before should definitely be enough for these lectures. Yeah, I think it's like yeah, that's a good point, Adam. This is like right in the middle, I think. Yeah. And the topics are going to like vary a lot between these lectures. So, I mean, there's, there's going to be some lectures that people find like much easier, much harder than other people. But uh, on average, I think this is a good estimation. Nice. Yeah, we're going to do a lot of um, like data structure stuff.
uh, after next week. The, the two weeks after that are going to be very data structures heavy. Adam Jamil has raised a hand. Thank you, Adam. Adam. All right. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it then, right? Yeah. Uh, well, see you guys either on um, Thursday or next week, hopefully. Okay. Bye, everyone. Oh, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so I think back with the uh, lexicographically less problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know I'm not supposed to do this, right? But I said if they're the same length, you can compare um, the, like, okay, if the hash code's made, like, in the way that was described before, then you can just compare the hash codes if the two strings are the same length. And then... I but what about the what about the last test case over here, right? These are the same length. How does comparing them give you any information about yeah. which one is smaller? So, um, unless I'm misunderstanding, the hash code basically um, uses like ASCII to like I guess convert. Uh, I yeah, think I see what you're saying. Big issue is that it's under mod M, yeah. so they're uh, not actually going to be smaller or bigger. If it wasn't mod M, that would work. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay. Yeah. Because okay. the, the problem is um, the numbers would blow up to be like really huge by the time you got to like a length, I don't know, like even 10. You probably wouldn't be able to hold that in the long run. Okay. But yeah, that is a really good idea. I hadn't thought of that. And then, um, so I guess for like, let's say an actual problem in like a contest, um, <clears throat> like, uh, are we then like I guess supposed to have our own hash code like system or? You can just use one of ours if you want. I mean, yeah, we don't want to have like different preferences on what we like to have it set up as, but you can just copy one of ours or have your own or whatever. Or someone yeah. else's, honestly. Uh, the slides, um, Actually, I'm not sure if we've updated the link to the slides for this semester, but um, I will, I'll definitely do that now. I think um, and the, you can go to the slides, and uh, at the end there, there's a slide that uh, will have both of our templates on there. Okay. I mean, well, one thing is all my templates are in one file. Uh, here, I, mean, I can send in chat. It's literally all my templates. Okay, yeah, because I was like wondering, because um, I guess if you like make an, if you make your own hash code, right, then mm -hmm. you you can basically leverage it if you know how it works. Sometimes. Oh yeah, like so you're saying for something like that, I yeah. Think the trouble is that when you do stuff like that, you lose a lot of the nice properties. Like I don't, I don't much familiar with uh, uh, sure as any theorem specifically, um, but I, I suspect that there's like these nice properties of independence, or the fact that it's you know one over m, and this is nice properties you get. Um, as soon as you sort of add more structure to it to make it, uh, you know, uh, to be able to do these sort of things, you sort of lose the other sort of collision resistance properties. Um, the mod sort of smears everything out to make it collision resistant. Um, and so, so, so you add structure, uh, you, you probably lose some of that. I, it's nothing I, think, I don't know specific, but that's I think the main problem is that uh, your hashes would then like blow up to be basically like the size of the string. So like a huge number of bits, you wouldn't be able to store in a long one or anything. Um, Cause if you're trying to like directly compare the hashes, uh, I feel like that's going to be about the same complexity as like directly comparing the strings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll be worse because it'll be like because each power will be the size of the string, basically. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, thanks.